So welcome, welcome. We're wishing you all a very healthy, uh, happy and productive 2024. Thank you for joining us. As you all know, this is a very special day for us, uh, the 6th of January, the day that there was the official inauguration of the very first children's house, 1907 in Rome. And um, also to, to let you know that we're really grateful that we're joined today, not only by all of you, because without you, we'd be talking to ourselves. So you are the essential ingredients, but we are also joined by our president, Alain Tudin. Uh, he is professor of peace studies, and we're also joined by Takako Fukatsu, who is uh, a Montessori advocate in Japan. And they're both here to share their commitment to a Montessori concept that we all know is embedded in our values, in our work, in our shared commitment, which is the concept of peace. We know that we want to prepare for a more peaceful world. And so the term, the title of today's talk is cross-pollinating peace. And both speakers are going to actually delve into their own past, their own history and their own aspirations to share with you something of this mission that is so dear to all our hearts. Once our speakers begin, we would ask, please, that you turn off your videos. But once the speeches are over and we have questions, we want you to turn them back on so that we can all see each other and uh, connect. We are also going to encourage you to put your greetings into the chat because I'm sure many of you will be seeing each other for the first time in some months or years. Uh, we'd also like you please to put your questions into the chat. And as we're moving along, um, we will have the team uh, in Amsterdam uh, supporting those questions and sometimes giving you answers to them and other times uh, sending them to me. And we'll look at some of those questions at the end of the two talks so that we can answer some of them. Now, the team in Amsterdam, I'm not sure if you, you recognize them uh, all, but I'm going to introduce them. So as you know, we have uh, Joka, uh, who uh, actually helps organize the talks. We have Carolina, who is here to help support uh, uh, the talks and the questions. And we have a new member of staff, Ren, who is here also. Ren, if you wave, uh, you can see Ren. Uh, she's also here. So, so we're here to support you and to support your, your thoughts and your questions. But I would like to share something with you that we think is rather special. We have a text that was published in 1924, which makes it exactly 100 years old. And this text was published in the journal, The Call of Education, which was the very first journal that was directly edited by Maria Montessori herself. The text was published in a number of languages. So even in those early days, Maria Montessori was aware that the movement was global and that she wanted her words to reach as many as possible. And so at the time it was published in uh, Italian and French and German and Dutch and uh, was called uh, La Chiamata or L'Appel de l'Education. So there were many attempts in the early days to try to make sure that the movement itself was reached by Maria Montessori herself and through her words. So I hope that you will allow me to just read a couple of paragraphs from that text to set the tone for today. I think the words are fresh. I think they speak to us today in our work. And I think that they are really um, a wonderful start to 2024. She said, those whose interest is in spiritual values, who seek after the highest in the human being, will recognize in our schools a work of love. Love looking beneath external appearances, understands the many needs in the child with transient appearances, which are commanding and fundamental. These needs may be obscure and difficult to express, yet on them, life depends. Love leads us to make a refuge for the divine, side of child nature, disregarded 
misunderstood and to open up the way for his spiritual development. Even those who stop at a superficial observation of facts, and she's talking about looking at the children in the school at this moment, will see here a school harmonious in its simplicity, where children work unwearyingly, visibly building characters without the teacher's correction or interference. Such observers will be struck by a feature new to schools, for the child is actuated by an inner directing power, no longer by the will of the teacher driving him on. Here lies the germ of a great social reform for the human being who is engaged in conquering himself has his feet set in the way of peace. It's beautiful, isn't it? And so with that, with her words in our minds and our ears and our hearts, I'm delighted to introduce to you our president, Alain Chudin, who was appointed in April 2022. He is, as you know, the professor of peace studies and the director of the International Center of Nonviolence at the Durban University of Technology, South Africa. Prior to this, he served as lead consultant to the United Nations Special Advisor on Africa for fast tracking the SDGs, and he has extensive humanitarian experience, having worked with UNICEF and Save the Children in child protection in Africa and the Middle East. If that wasn't sufficient, we can also say that he is actually a practicing <laughs> registered psychologist and holds a PhD in psychology from the University of Natal and a PhD in moral philosophy and theology from the University of Cambridge. We're going to turn over this morning, this afternoon, this evening's discussion and talk to Alain. Thank you, Alain. Thank you so much, Lynn. It's lovely to see all of you from all over the world. Uh, I can see Dinny from Denmark, uh, Pete's there coming to us from Japan. I say friends from Latin America, friends from the continent, yes. So just wonderful to see everyone uh, in this collegial uh, and warm environment. So um, I'd like to get uh, cracking and uh, on with the presentation. I think Takako has so many wonderful things to share with us that I'll move on to the presentation if I may. All right, so hopefully you can uh, you can see you can see my presentation. Um, so this theme of cross pollinating peace is really a fascinating one uh, for us, um, especially in the light of everything that we are uh, facing as a world as we enter twenty twenty four. Um, and I thought it might be helpful for us to frame our theme for today. Um, and look at some, you know, ruminations on education for peace. So recently, uh, as some of you may be aware, uh, we were generously donated some course notes from the niece of Ruby Woodford, who sat Maria Montessori's 1929 course. So the same year that AMI was founded. Um, and you can see from this first quote that speaking about the powers of the educator, Dr. Montessori has a different idea of these powers. First, we must consider how can we intervene without damaging the child? The butterfly does not break open the chrysalis of its young. We must be restrained. Every help and intervention which is useless brings about an arrest of development. We must not undo. Every individual must grow for himself. The child must carry out this difficult, serious work of growth by himself the work of becoming an adult. The child is the father of the man. So that's underlined in the original, what you see there, the italics I have added. Um, now, sorry, I'm just trying to, uh, there we go. So picking up on that, um, I wanted to share with you that um, I'm sorry you used this last sentence that's italicized as originally penned by William Wordsworth widely in all of her writings. You can find this in The Absorbent Mind, The Secret of Childhood, 
what you should know about your child, education and peace, and the child society in the world. So we can see this as something of a mantra for Montessori. And I think it's really, really powerful for us today, especially what Lynn, given what Lynn shared with us from the call, to look at the call to education as the call to peace. Um, because it's really important that we reflect on the important or the, the impact of childhood experiences on the path of later adult life. So this, again, is from this year's presidential message, which has just been released. Uh, and you'll see there that we're saying, if we want peace, prepare the child appropriately. If we want justice, likewise, no poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being, quality education, gender equality, or any other SDGs, the same. The pivotal words prepare appropriately can only arise from wholesome values shared by prepared adults committed to promoting the independence of each precious and unique human life. So that will probably be the only page of hard hitting, well, I can't say the only page of hard hitting text, but it's just to give you some idea of what frames um, uh, the, the, the talk that I'll be sharing with you today. That said, um, I'm not a plant scientist uh, and a biologist in, in that sense of the word, but what do we mean by cross-pollination? So if we look at the process here, we can see that pollen from one flower transfers to the pistils of another, helped by insects and wind or by hand. So if we were looking at roses, you would want to prepare different roses at a similar stage of development to prevent self-pollination of the seed parent you'd remove the anthers or pollen sacs from the blooms before the pollen is released. This process is best at sunrise when the blooms open. Petals and anthems removed after emasculation, the bud is ready to receive pollen from another variety. Pollen enters the pistil through the stigma and travels down the style to ovules in the ovary. If fertilized, ovules develop into seeds. Then finally, the success of pollinating depends on placing the pollen on the stigma at the appropriate time. So now you might be thinking, well, why on earth this, you know, um, why on earth this uh, issue? Well, let's look at this relative to the cross-pollination of peace. Pollen from the one flower transferring to another. What if we observe the rich humanity in one child? and reflect on the plight of others in difficult circumstances. Left to natural devices or conscious intentional design and manual implementation. If we think of different roses at a similar stage of development, what about different children at similar developmental stages? To prevent self-pollination of the seed parent, remove the anthers from the blooms before pollen is released. Well, let's be aware of local context such as violence, deprivation, abuse, to prevent this from taking seed in the child. What are the alternatives? We'll get to that. So best at sunrise when blooms open, science shows that early intervention with appropriate developmental strategies is critical. And instead of conditions of violence and the seeds of disharmony, what about creating conducive conditions for optimal development? So appropriately prepared environments by uh, prepared adults. Just as the pollen enters the pistil through the stigma and travels down uh, to the ovary for fertilization, peace enters the child's world through conducive environment and by modeling from the guide over time. If given the chance, peach, peace catches and catalyzes the broader community. What we learn from the success of pollination is that timing is everything and conducive, conditions need to be conducive for cross-pollination. Okay, so with that in mind, I thought I would just uh, get to our topic today. This is a photograph, as you can see, it's a class photograph. I apologize for the fact that um, there are only boys in the photograph. This happens to be the school that I went to, um, and this is me over here at a very young age uh, with my classmates. As you can see, we're all from different backgrounds, um, 
And you might think, well, why on earth is this being shown to us? Because as I mentioned in conversation with Yoka in Maria Montessori's study, this photograph, believe it or not, was illegal. When this photograph was taken in late 70s, early 80s in South Africa, little children of different backgrounds were not allowed to be educated together as part of the government's institutionalized separate development or apartheid. So that image that you're looking at is an illegal image. We didn't care. So little Lesiba is sitting, me, sitting next to me here. We'd go to his house to play. Or Riaz over here would come to my house. We might go to Javed's house. We, we were not actually physically even allowed to go to one another's homes. However, our parents um, believed in a different reality and provided us with the opportunity of an inclusive education. But within the context of our time, this photo was an anomaly. So what were we seedlings of? Let's have a look at South Africa in the 1970s. Um, you know, for the majority of the people in this country, uh, quality education was an impossibility, as I've said, because of separate development and the so-called Abominable Bantu Education Act. Um, leading in the 19, you know, with an upswell from the 60s into the 70s, culminating in the 1976 Soweto riots. You can see Hector Peterson being taken away there by fellow learners. So the complete antithesis uh, of what we would regard as an education, um, quite brutal, actually. So, you know, here we are talking about democracy, uh, which is inclusive, which promotes peace, versus apartheid, which was exclusive and violent. So on the left-hand side, bear in mind, these are all children. On the left-hand side, Onsvul Saar met Alla Rasa Leva. That's Afrikaans which we were all forced to learn at school. And it means we want to live together with people of all races. Okay, children protesting. On the right-hand side, the sign was taken in the late 1980s. Uh, city of Durban, under section blah, blah, of the Durban beach laws, this bathing area is reserved for the sole use of members of the white race group. And you see a little white child benefiting from that. So what's the point? The seeds that you saw uh, turned into saplings. Look at us some years on, and you'll see children who've grown into teenagers and young adults who are integrated, who received an inclusive education, who were not bigoted and prejudiced, but who honestly saw the other as friend, who didn't see the other as threat, who uh, celebrated difference in the other and a shared common humanity. And there's incredible power in that. So that's my entree into today's talk, uh, is just to share that with you. Now, this is why we've said in terms of cross-pollination, we did not want to be pollinated into the society that we grew up in. And thankfully for us, things changed um, with the democratic dispensation. But back to the topic today, cross-pollinating peace, and that symbol that you see on your left apparently is the symbol for cross-pollination. So here's a practical story. And why am I? Why are we talking about this today? You will see a social worker in the bottom corner of the screen with a metal pole. Next to her, you will see children around three to four years of age, whom we found in a rural area of the Eastern Cape, uh, physically beating each other assaulting each other uh, whilst we were conducting a citizen governance survey in that part of the world. We were mortified by this because we wouldn't have expected uh, young people like this to be visiting such violence on one another. The middle picture shows you an image of a person in the inner city of my hometown, Durban, uh, trying to wash themselves from water gushing out of the street. Um, also, just to set the scene for you um, of immense poverty and deprivation, whilst the little bike on the right hand corner is in the yards of what is supposed to be a, a crash serving the inner city children who live in, a, in an urban slum. Um, so violence, deprivation, inequality 
have a look at the social worker again. Behind her, you now see the so-called school within which the children were hoping to receive an education. Um, we've just spoken about self and other and the universality of human dignity. You know, how are you supposed to get ahead with, with a start like that in life? The middle image just shows waste and filth. Uh, on the outside border of the crash that I showed you earlier in the inner city, the municipality has since cleared this up, but it's still problematic. And if you want to understand, you know, a bit more about the region, you can actually see the map uh, with the red dot of where the rural context is, and next to it, about two and a half kilometers drive, Durban. So, what's the story about cross-pollinating peace? Well, having had that very, very uh, disturbing but eye-opening encounter of witnessing what these children were doing to each other, I was fortunate to visit Red's Montessori School in New York City, where the school head, Sharon Lickerman, allowed me to observe some classes. And I have to say that this was really an epiphany for me, because in one of the classes, I observed a young girl who uh, urinated and was feeling very bad about this, quite embarrassed, was crying, having a little cry. And two of her colleagues came to her, her classmates. One gave her a little hug. The other had a mop uh, and a bucket, gave her the mop and bucket. Um, and after the little hugs, she got on with it, cleaned up what had happened, went and washed her hands and got back to her activity. This was a very, very different experience from what I had witnessed uh, amongst the children that I've already described. And it showed me the power of grace and courtesy and the power of the value-based uh, education that I think is profoundly Montessorian and what impact this can have on the life of a child. Inspired by this, um, we looked at how we could then, through AMI, uh, transform these children's lives. So here in the left corner, the very same children who were previously um, giving each other a hard time are now working together, They're cleaning in the kitchen with one of the teachers behind them. You can see initially we entered the school, got a dojo tank in. Children are playing together and learning together. There's Luyanda, who's now an AMI administrator in the background. You'll see Hombagazi a bit later. So about profound changes. What I wanted to say here is, uh, and it's really important, so um, the change registers not only in the child exclusively. We were visited by mothers uh, because some of these children had to travel for about five to eight kilometers just to come to the school. And the mothers would say to us, the children have been through this incredible transformation. Um, they come home, they'll chew us out if we don't wash our hands before we prepare food. Um, some of you may have heard me say this before. One little boy went up to his dad. This is a patriarchal society. He was sitting on his, uh, on his veranda or porch, handed him the broom and said, we take turns at school to do this. Mum's done this already today. It's your turn. And the dad was shamefaced into actually getting up and, you know, doing his bit in the household. So as we mentioned earlier, um, just in the same way as we see the process of cross-pollination cross and pollen landing, the pollen lands through the child and has a radically transformative impact across its community. In this slide, you can see subsequent to the situation that you saw in the beginning, new classrooms that have been put up since the intervention occurred. You see Hombagazi over here, who is an AMI guide, um, empowering other women. Um, and you can see what happens when they're empowered with respect to the children. So that is our study of peace in, in rural areas, and this is work that's ongoing. What about cross-pollinating peace in the city? What if? Now have a look at this scenario. This is inner city Durban. The left image uh, shows you a park that's been abandoned. Um, there's rubbish all over the place. You can see things lying in the ground, the ground is fallow. The middle image, you can see filth, we've seen that before. And to the right, you can see the effects of human abandonment. What if that was replaced with, and I'm just showing you, so bear in mind what you saw, 
This is the same field a few months on. You can see that it's being prepared for something that's a whole, a, a, a whole lot more positive, right? In the middle image, you can see that the filth that you saw earlier, instead of filth here, you have vegetables that are growing and fruits that are growing. And to the right, instead of human abandonment, you actually have Gabriel, who's in charge of the community garden, uh, mapping out a strategy for sustainability in the middle of this uh, depressed inner city area. So this is what we're doing from the informal settlement of Dalton to Davenport Park. How exactly do we hope to go about this? Well, our aim is to have a world-class Montessori center uh, adjacent to the inner city slum, along with a community garden for children and adults living in urban poverty. So here you can see the 6,000 square meter previously abandoned park. You can see what it's looking like now. You can see the building that was derelict um, and yeah. So how do we cross pollinate peace here? We are hoping with grant support that we've just received to be able to renovate the derelict house and transform it into an AMI center to train and work with community rooted educators to, from the community, I have to say. So from the inner city slum, as well as training and working with community gardeners also from the inner city slum. We cross pollinate peace with appropriately prepared materials and environments, appropriately prepared adults uh, in order to have appropriately prepared children. Uh, this again, it wasn't intended to be like this, but you can see the little quote there, of all things, love is the most potent. This dovetails with what Lynn said earlier about uh, recognizing the work of love. Why do we do this? To promote flowering across life. Um, you know, a lot of people have the misconception that we are only concerned as AMI with children in their earliest years. We're not. We're concerned with development across the lifespan. Uh, we're concerned with special needs uh, and globally different contexts and environments. Um, so then what exactly are we pollinating? Peace is one of those. Um, you know, fruits of pollination, it's SDG number 16, but we're also pollinating the others when we do this work. We're aiming to reduce poverty and hunger, to promote health and well-being. We have an emphasis on quality education and the work we do is gender affirmative for women. Um, we're trying to provide decent work and economic growth. We're investing in industry, innovation, and infrastructure, we're trying to reduce inequalities here so that we can have more sustainable cities and communities in rural areas too. This dovetails really importantly with production and consumption, as well as climate action, how we treat the world in which we live. And of course, without partnerships, none of this would be possible. So for us, the bedrock of all of this is peace, love and understanding through education. can see here we're a global organization and our cross pollinators on the board come from across the world and it's really a delight and a pleasure for me to actually share uh, the faces of our friends and colleagues with you so this is a board level um, and on the ground all of you out there and somewhere or another across pollinators we have our administrators over here we have trainers, we have parents, we have guides, we have trainers of trainers, we have, you know, remarkable people. Uh, and I think it's important for a second, just to focus on this point made by Maria Montessori in the London lectures of 1946. She says, there is a vital force in every human being which leads them to make ever greater efforts for the realization of individual potentialities. Our tendency is to realize them. Joy and interest will come when we can realize the potentialities that are within us. So these are the people doing the work on the ground. Uh, you, to a large extent. And then cross-pollinators as well, our partners. Um, you heard us mention earlier that we we're involved in community-rooted education. 
which is an attempt to actually make Montessori more accessible to underserviced communities. Uh, we're collaborating scientifically with UNESCO as well. And uh, last year, we joined the Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action. Uh, and we're an active member of that alliance, trying to work out how we can work in child and family spaces by people who've been displaced due to different effects, whether it's natural disasters or conflict. Um, and we're actively piloting the work that I've just shared with you here so that we as Montessorians can be of value in the broader world around us. So that said, um, I hope I've given you some, some insights and something of, valuable, uh, of value rather in terms of cross-pollinating peace. And there you can see the flower taking root with the old dilapidated house alongside it, which if you watch the space, we were hoping will be turned into a wonderful AMI center that can serve the needs of people who need this most. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Alain. That was uh, really a, a tour de force from, from early years to where you are today and, and your experiences. Very grateful to you for, for sharing those ideas with us and also for demonstrating the various levels of engagement that AMI and all of its community is currently working together on. Thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, thank thank you. you. I'd like now to, to pass over to uh, Takako uh, Fukatsu. Uh, Takako is actually one of the uh, founders of the Children's House Environments on the Peace Boat, which she began in uh, 2009, and she'll be telling you something about that. Her idea is to really share the concepts and ideas that peace starts from children. She does this in multiple ways, which she will be explaining to you in the next few minutes. Takako was, in fact, um, a vice president uh, currently of the Friends of AMI Nippon, which is our AMI-affiliated society. And she attended the very first ESF assembly that took place in 1999 at uh, Chito di Castello. She has many other accolades to her name, but I will leave her now to talk directly to you about her own experiences and her work in the realms of Montessori and peace. Thank you very much, Takako. And if we could all come off our videos again just for this moment, and please, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the chat or to talk to one another in the chat as life uh, moves on in the next few minutes. Takako, can we pass over to you please at this thank moment. you lynn thank you so much <laughs> and mm. thank you alan for wonderful um explanation of why we came up with this unique title as a matter of fact um alan really named it because when we were talking about this army talk we are doing a meeting and i said to everybody that I had been working after I left a classroom. Um, I've been working with like-minded and different type of professionals. And um, we enrich each other by working that way. And then Alan said, it's cross-pollinating. <laughs> so thank you for that title. So I would like to share my slides. And I hope you can see at just a moment, it's coming. Hmm. Okay. Can you see the title page? I hope <laughs> we can. We can. Yes. Okay. Yes. okay, thank you so much. Okay, um, let's see. I really have been um, working with other organizations. And um, before I begin my talk today, I thought maybe I should do a little self-introduction just to explain why I am so focused on refugee problems. And I'm very concerned about displaced persons now also but I just wanted to tell you where I've come from. And um, this is a map of Thailand. 
and this red rod, I, I mean, dots, I'm sure many of us met here five months ago, only five months ago. That was a wonderful um, World Congress organized by Thai committee. And we all gathered in this red place, Bangkok. But 40 some years ago, Thailand looked a little different. It was in early 1980s, there are three neighboring countries, um, Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnamese, Vietnam, they had a very rapid um, government or political change that there were lots of um, refugees. We can call it three million um, refugees have to fled their country and they were seeking Thailand for asylum. It's a very safe country to move into. So Thailand became a host country for those three neighboring countries. So I will show you some arrows. Um, these arrows indicating where they've come from. Let's see. Let's see the top number one arrow. This is where Laotians came into Thailand, the northern part. And there is a river, Mekong River, dividing Thailand and Laos. So people who were afraid of prosecutions, they had to swim across this river to get into Thailand. And very unfortunate that many of them drowned and didn't get to the Thai border. And here is Cambodian, number two arrows. Here's uh, people had to walk to um, Thailand and there are deep jungles this uh, at the border with lots of landmines. So if, if you are lucky, you are able to walk into the refugee camp with malnourished or part of your body's been really destroyed by the landmine. But then we call it land people are from Cambodia. And now what about Vietnamese? Well, there is no connection to Thailand. I mean, a direct connection by land. So they have to sail. They have to wait for the certain wind so that they can go reach this southern peninsula of Thailand called um, Songkla. So that's where the refugee camp for Vietnamese are for. Now, um, a little brief history of myself is that I was working for emergency relief NGO um, up in this northern area, and I was a um, language instructor for those Laotians who really wanted to resettle in Japan. So they want to have a second life in Japan. So <laughs> yeah, I was. Um, I don't know what I was doing, but maybe grace and courtesy lesson on bowing. I don't know. But all these students, including a child, they all swam this river. I took this photograph um, last August. After the Congress in Bangkok, there was a tour called Eastern Fabulous. And as I saw this name of the city called Nongkai, which is exactly where this yellow arrow is pointing. I just really had to sign up. I really wanted to go see what that city now looks like 40 some years ago, years later. And now you can see that land over there is Laos. Maybe that's where the capital Vientiane and this side is Thailand. But this is kind of rainy season, but they usually swim when it's dry. But then um, I had to go visit other encampments. Like what about Cambodian children or Cambodian people are doing in this encampment? What about this in uh, Songkla, the Vietnamese camp? So I was kind of visiting along this uh, encampment. And then in this 
Cambodian encampment, there was a preschool called House of Hope. And that was only open for 12 years, but 2,700 children attended this preschool. And it was thatched roof with all this bamboo um, available around that area. So um, I thought, oh, how nice that, you know, there is a preschool. But then um, I found out this was Montessori school later. And um, at that time, I thought um, peace starts from United Nations or any other political government that that's the kind of a top down idea of peace starts from of somebody with authority. But the president of this school said to me, Takako, peace starts from children. And to me, that was a total new idea. And there were children doing lots of washing. And these are all made by the carpenter in the refugee camp. And um, children doing dressing frames. And everything was handmade by the parents. And this is a very um, famous uh, weaving called chroma. Um, this is a hand woven by the mothers usually. So that's part of the dressing frames. So I felt, hmm, peace starts from children. That's a totally new idea. And also Montessori was a very new vocabulary for me. Now, this is a very short introduction of why I'm so concerned with refugees, but there's something I learned working in the refugee camp. And I felt I just wanted to share three of those um, mainly three, but um, when to ship from emergency relief to self-reliance stage is very difficult. Well, I know it's so important. There's, it is no doubt that emergency relief is necessary, but there is a stage that one has to shift from emergency to more self-reliant stage. I can call it more rehabilitative stage. The reason I'm saying this is that I was also asked by UNHCR, it's United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. They are the one counts how many refugees have, have arrived in the morning. So we they count, okay, 20 families arrived. So I give them rations. I distribute um, canned fish from um, Japanese government. And every day, every day in my spare time from um, instruction, I mean, teaching Japanese, I was sharing um, canned fish to the uh, beneficiaries, Laotians. And, but when you open it, you, you just finish eating and that's it. So every day I felt, hmm, is there any better way of doing this service? And then fishing pole. What if we supply fishing pole and uh, there is Mekong River right in front of them? So maybe they can really self-feed when they are hungry. And um, that kind of self-reliance project is so important when it's really prolonged refugee life. So another um, thing I learned is that absorbent mind is active all the time during the war too, unfortunately. And I met this boy at the Thai-Cambodian border and he was wearing a um, camouflage jacket and pants, and he was pointing a toy gun to his friend. And um, to my surprise, I visited this preschool. That was, of course, not Montessori, but it was a, a local preschool. And on the shelf, toy shelf, there are lots of 
toy guns um, displayed by the teacher. So I said to the teacher, well, why do you have this on the shelf? But the teacher said, oh, they like it. They just really like doing it. So I put them on the shelf. And they said, that's what they see every day. They were really at the border of Thai Cambodia. So there are lots of um, border control guards. And that's exactly what they looked like. And children, of course, look at them every day. They think they're cool. So absorbent mind just really sucked up everything. And then I guess they feel they're so proud or, you know, they just looking like the uh, guard. And um, I felt this drawing, another a child, this was done in a Cambodian refugee camp, but I think this was five years old who drew this, but if you look carefully, um, their bodies in front of this child and there are tears running down from eyes, but it really seems that these tiny hands had to bury the body into the ground and um, who knows what happened, but I think this shows the process of I guess, journey that they had to do from Cambodia to Thailand, or maybe that's happened in their village where they were. But this drawing was um, a, a part of a, a book called Cambodia Chronicles. It's uh, published by Federation of UNESCO Japan, but there is really series of drawings done by children and it really shows what they have absorbed in during the war or during the conflict. And I strongly feel children should see adults using hands for peace. And I saw another man, he was in the refugee camp making a music instrument and he was using a very sharp knife but still he was creating something for the culture for the <clears throat> i guess for the expression self-expression but really we should make effort so that children at this moment they are at war but somewhere in their daily life they should see adults using hands for peace And I don't have time to go into the, all the details about the experience in the Cambodia or the other refugee camps, but I was so lucky to be invited uh, by AMI. It's an old logo of AMI. And to speak at the 24th International Congress at the UNESCO headquarter, Paris, that was in 2001. And the lady who taught me Peace starts from children, Yukie Sato, there she is. And um, we talked about, the title is very long, Pioneer Non-Classroom Montessori Experiences of Aid to Children in Cambodian Refugee Communities in Thailand. <laughs> if um, you are interested, um, I wrote an article in the communications I don't know if you know that booklet that published by AMI for many, many years. And um, I found this in my bookshelf, but 2003, the fourth, um, I guess, booklet. And um, if you are interested, you can, you know, find out more in it. And then another um, discovery in their refugee camp is that outreach as well as in reach. Well, I always thought that was my misconception on my part is that I always thought that needy children were to be found in the developing countries and that we need to reach out to them from 
our well-to-do countries like Japan. But upon my return from many outreach projects in the refugee camp, I found that many of the Japanese children, they were really suffering from academic pressure. So it's like insomnia or eating disorders, suicide from really pressure, academic pressure at um, society at large. And then I started to think that not only for the children in the underprivileged areas, but we also need to do in-reach program for the children in the developed countries like Japan. So what can we do to really help children? And for both children, we need to really share the joy of learning because one part, the children, have no schools to go to. There's no, of, no joy of learning, but also in the developed countries, like in my country, Japan, just really not want to learn anything. It's just memorization. So we have to come from both ends to work for the betterment of children. And I decided to really work outside of this box, do something with, I guess, cross-pollinating or peace with other agencies. So the first one was Peace Boat. Maybe some of you have heard me talk at um, AGM two years ago. So um, this time I'm going to kind of briefly talk about what Peace Boat is about and not really in great um, detail, but um, have you ever traveled by boat instead of airplane? It's much slower and you see we are all interconnected with the ocean. That's what children say. We are all connected. It's really physical, concrete experience that children say instead of airplane. Now, what is Peace Boat? Just briefly, a Japan-based international NGO founded in 83 by three university students. Just at this time, um, there was a problem called textbook problem well japanese textbook they rewrote textbook to say japan has advanced to other asian countries instead of invaded so these three students said this is not true so they said let's talk to the st students in you know asian countries by really visiting face to face, knee to knee. In Japanese, we say knee to knee. So that's how Peace Boat started, really a dialogue with other people. Now, it aims to promote peace, human rights, sustainability by sailing around the world, visiting 20 different countries on the three months voyage. Now, many of you have really um, helped me a go to your schools or training centers. I really want to thank everybody who were at the ESF, the very first ES, who invited me and children to go visit your school. Both on board and in port, the program used both travel and education to explore its aims, centered on experiential learning and intercultural communication. And it is an intergenerational um, community of 2,000 passengers. Well, sometimes 1,500, but age range from two years and a half to sometimes 92 years old. So it's really like a small village. And we have northbound trip, and sometimes we have southbound. And northbound, we go to many, many Nordic countries 
where I visited many of my friend's school training centers. So what Peace Boat does is we they do a lot of um, tree planting, like sustainability and education, including Montessori, disarmament. They are really aiming for the nuclear free world and um, Peace Talk. Peace Talk, we invite many guest speakers on board and talk about peace. Um, and also humanitarian support. Um, for example, we deliver, since it's a boat, we can carry anything almost. Um, we carry um, um, violins and all the instruments to El Sistema. And um, of course, we uh, carry any relief um, materials to uh, troubled areas. As a matter of fact, the recent um, Japanese earthquake and tsunami on the 2nd of January, the emergency team was already in Ishikawa Prefecture. So children's house on boat. It's, a, I think, first floating Montessori school in the world since 2009. Actually, I started uh, preparing since 2008, but the first voyage is 2009. And sometimes we have many children, like close to 20, but sometimes we have only three children. <laughs> but before this class started, it was very adult-centered boat because it was only adults. But um, since this Montessori Children's House program, I think they have become so aware that children are the real cause of peace and i'm really really happy for this slow change in an organization like this that and um, children look at the world as they are they eat they dress differently but we are different but that's 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 okay and that's really fun so more than 180 children participated in this program since 2009. And um, two years old say, oh, I didn't know night comes after the sun sets into the ocean. Or six years old says, Takako is Japan rich country by visiting some um, underprivileged areas. So they find something so concrete and um, it's really a sen sensorial experience. And they do a lot of work, um, especially window washing. And I talk to passengers, um, whoever wants to know about Montessori, um, Peace starts from children, and also we take some sensorial materials out, and we children show adults how to work with them, like sen um, solid cylinders. And um, here are the teachers, um, more than forty AMI trained guys, but also some are going to be AMI guys and there's a nice cycle that people who have gone on a this boat go back and then tell others and of course other children uh, teacher come on but also uh, people who had never had Montessori um, training they said I'm going to take that course after I get off the boat so it's really nice cycle and I'm really doing this also for the guys for the teachers because i don't think we have time to look at our own country from outside it's really good to look at your own country objectively and uh, see the good parts and some not so nice parts too but really looking at your own country yourself 
you know, objectively, and then use it for your work after you go home in the, in um, your uh, school. So I talk to the crew members because sometimes crew members are so nice to children that they overdo everything. And two years and three years old, they said, I want to do it by myself. So before voyage starts, I always get on the boat um, in the very beginning that I talk to the crew members. You know, they are not really being you know, mean to you, but they are just so trying to be so independent so they understand. So they always ask for choice. Would you like to pour your milk by yourself or shall I do it for you? <laughs> so in port, we visited AMI several years ago and we were at the, you know, den. And here's Amsterdam and uh, Adrian riding <laughs> with the children from the boat. And here's Dini from Denmark. Thank you for the photograph. <laughs> and there's Sister Vaz from Sri Lanka, a beautiful building. So um, this year, um, August, from 16th to December 1st, we are visiting many, many countries again, 108 days. And if your school is near the seaport, if we can visit, please let us know. We'd love to have this exchange program, children visiting your school, and your children can come to the boat and um, it would be a wonderful opportunity. So this is the end of the peace boat. And now my second cross-pollinating of peace is Cafe Slow in Kokubunji, Tokyo. And very conscious consumers come to this restaurant, I mean, cafe, because it's organic and very safe food. And parents want to bring their children here because of that. And we felt Montessori has to be here. Montessori has to be seen in this cafe. That's why Friends of Army Nippon, the affiliate, decided to open a satellite office um, 2019. And here's a little tiny office. This is where I translate books. And so far, the booklets, mini booklets, we combine them to make a thicker book. So um, we do a lot of collaboration with the cafe too. And there's a bulletin board for a upcoming event. On the right, there's Judy Orion. Um, as a matter of fact, in two days, January 8th, um, Judy Orion is um, doing an online talk. And if you're interested, you should contact um, Institute of Tokyo Alumni Association or maybe Setsuko Miura. Um, and the talk is going to be Demystifying Montessori. Very interesting mysterious title but if you like it please contact and here is the display of all the kitchen tools or toys that i can lend out to parents um these are just um display but also they can borrow and parents always ask how long can i borrow this so i said um, until they are bored and they said oh <laughs> so they bring back and they said I didn't know children get bored of this mobile but they are not looking at it anymore meaning they started to really observe children baby so I'm glad instead of saying oh bring them back in two weeks or three weeks they really start to enjoy but now I want to talk about cafe slow itself why we are in this um, cafe for our satellite office. But please look at this symbol, our logo. It has um, sloth. Why sloth? Actually, this cafe staff worship, they think it's a goddess. It's a symbol of 
SDGs. Why? <laughs> Low energy lifestyle. Sloths only have few muscle tissue to hang and themselves from a tree and they climb up on top of the trees in the morning to soak up the sunshine to recharge energy and recycling. Once a week, sloths risk their life to climb down for the toilet. They're like jaguars or um, eagles, the predators, but they always cover them with dead leaves and they are returning the nutrition back to the trees. Symbiosis, they wander from tree to tree, another to avoid competition and conflicts among their groups. And lastly, nonviolence. They do not use the clouds to attack, but to dig a pit or hang from the tree. So already this is really a um, sustainable cafe. And not only that, it's straw bale made out of. We carry this uh, straw from Biwako Lake, solar panel, candle night events, and it was very Montessori from the very beginning. On the opening, I mean, we started to construct straw bale and there is uh, Susan Stevenson taking photographs and Judy Orion, she did a talk at this cafe and Karen Salzman, she came. And Naoko Ogawa, when we opened this satellite office, we had a, a wonderful talk by Naoko and followed by um, organic buffet dinner, which was so wonderful. So Montessori with tea or a coffee since 19, 20, 2019, um, we do this child care consultation service over a cup of organic tea or coffee. And the proceeds go to one third, go to Cafe Slow for the venue and cafe itself, but two third go to Friends of Army Nippon. And this is the inside of the cafe and the very back of this um, cafe, there is a little corner with some tables. And so we can talk. Sometimes parents come, um, very unusual, but husband do come <laughs> and here and this is a little corner where children can wait while we are talking sometimes many children come and um i have several um manipulatives that they love and parents are so surprised that to see children so absorbed in what they are doing and few selected toys, books can satisfy your children. And to find out that kind to children does not mean doing everything for them. To know that choice, uh, choice making is really thinking. And find out that children enjoy not only toys, but also house chore that their parents are doing every day. So this is the end of my cafe slow story. And then lastly, my third cross pollinating of peace with like minded in a completely different profession that is organic coffee farmers. Cafe slow. Um, imports, well, we have uh, importers, but we serve um, many different kinds of coffee from South America, but mainly Mexico, Mexico, and they're from indigenous um, tribe in Mexico. And organic farmers and Montessorians share something very important in common. Do you know what they, what, what that is? It is observation. They are not dependent on pesticide or insecticide or um, agricultural corporation tell you what to do, when to do. But organic farmers, they really have to observe the crops so well. And this is a very well-known Japanese farmer, the natural farmer, we call it the philosopher, um, Masanobu Fukuoka, and he said, Observe nature well, and you will see the expression of its intelligence. He's very famous for one straw 
revolution. It's translated into many, many languages. So wisdom of indigenous people, we call it agroforestry. This is a combination word of agriculture and forestry. It is a way to save forest instead of cutting all the trees, chopping all the trees to make monoculture plantation of coffee. The indigenous people like Nahuatl, this is a name of the group, group in Mexico, observed nature so well that like Montessorians, so they found out that coffee grows best in biodiversity. So agriculture based on observation, really, um, if you just want to make coffee in a monoculture plantation down here, the soil gets really poorer and then barren. But if you uh, grow coffee in a forest, it's like win-win situation because coffee loves to be in the shade, not in a direct sunlight. So the forest can give them this nice shade. And then they have trees like banana, mango, uh, papaya. These leaves also uh, fall down and then they make a very wonderful fertilizer for the coffee. And if the coffee price go down, they can still make living by selling these fruits while those monocultures cannot do. So I went to this village, um, Nawat tribe, and I talked about, well, they asked me to, so they said, what do you think about our farm? So I said, wonderful, but maybe you can raise children a little more organically because they were feeding six years old and they're always holding five years old. So I said, maybe. So I talked about Montessori in 2005, I think, to this group called Tosepan. This is the name of the ag agricultural group. And uh, they loved it. They just immediately understood because they are the great nature observers and they understood Montessori so right away. And the one staff was really interested in Montessori. Her name was Maria Luisa Arbores Gonzalez. And then she is kind of sitting next to me here. But to my surprise, she became a Mexican politician now. And um, she is really working so hard for this sustainable um, country, Mexico. And here is a lady who taught me everything about agriforestry, Patricia Mogel. And um, I know there is a mix, um, Congress coming up in 2026. I strongly recommend to um, Patricia to be one of the speakers. So Montessori communities, they used to name Tosepan Sori, but now I heard they changed it. But now they have a Montessori community of Nawat children. And yeah, they are. I'd love to visit them next next time in Mexico. But so this is the end of my story. And thank you for listening. And um, I have some um, addresses. You can look up Peace Boat and find out when we are going and Cafe Slow and my um, email address, Cafe Slow Montessori Gmail dot com. Thank you so much. Thank you very, very much indeed, uh, Takako, for that uh, extraordinary explanation of ways in which we can cross-pollinate uh, the, the meaningful work that we want to do through Montessori and in connection with others. I think uh, everyone's really enjoyed the story and the variety of different ways in which you have thought to connect with others. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for being here and some of the uh, there was a great deal of interest, uh, Takako, while you were speaking on the Peace Boat, not only on uh, what it does, but how others could get involved. So I wondered uh, on two fronts, would it be possible, first of all, for you to uh, uh, perhaps um, organize with us an another Zoom where we could contact uh, those that were interested? 
uh, and perhaps just uh, do do something very specific for those that uh, would like to know more. I don't know if that's possible. Of course. And um, we are now expanding to elementary program <laughs> and we need elementary teachers, but hopefully somebody who speaks Japanese. But, <laughs> but yes, we are open to, you know, anybody who are interested. I really want to do... Um, like a refresher course on the boat. <laughs> like maybe we can pick up um, Anne Kelly at uh, Tasmania in <laughs> two days <laughs> workshop on the boat. How about oh, that? <laughs> thank you, Takako. So so uh, if you wanted to put a contact uh, into the chat, that's fine. Otherwise you could leave it to us and we'll organize a, a Zoom and contact the people that are on this call because we can do that very easily. Sure, sure, that, okay? thank you. All right, thank you. And there's one more question for you. Somebody wanted to know the authors of the um, uh, one of the the documents that you just mentioned uh, on the straw. I'm just trying to oh, uh, yes. straw evolution. If you could just yes. in the author's name again, that would be very helpful to okay. all of us. Uh, His last name is Fukuoka. F U K A O K A. Fukuoka. Thank you. Can I? Uh -huh. yes, Perhaps again, you can pop that into the. Uh, yes. Uh, oh, uh, uh, Caroline has very kindly popped it in there. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you. <laughs> it's fantastic. And um, uh, so, in in some ways, the insights I think that both uh, yourself and Alain have shared have been absolutely extraordinary. Uh, uh, could I ask Alain from from your perspective? And we we won't keep you very much longer because we're twenty minutes over. So we'll be about another five minutes together. But Alain, from your perspective, uh, you've had a lot of experience um, in um, humanitarian action uh, for children all over the world. And would you be able to explain a little bit more about the reason for us joining the, the Alliance and what we're hoping could come from that? Thank you. And then I'll come back to you, Takako, with one more question and then we'll we'll close. Thank you. Sure, Lynn. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much for the question. Um, so actually, the uh, Alliance for... Uh, Child Protection and Humanitarian Action used to be known as the Child Protection Working Group, uh, led by UNICEF. Um, but as part of the kind of reforms of the UN system and the openness to bringing NGOs in for more collaboration, um, there was a rethink about how the alliance would work. Uh, and so given that way back in, gosh, 2015, we were talking about so-called child-friendly spaces um, in the system. Uh, in a revisitation um, of the notion of spaces that are enabling for children and their families, families displaced by uh, conflict, uh, displaced by climate issues. Um, and oftentimes we find that, um, you know, it's, it's an emergency response. So the situation has not necessarily been uh, sought out or researched to its full potential. Um, as Montessorians, there's a massive emphasis on the environment and the prepared environment. We also invest heavily uh, in terms of um, the training of Montessori guides, uh, who in turn, we think would be able to empower people who've been displaced, so adults in these communities, who could do something not only to recover their own self-esteem or self-worth, um, for example, using community-rooted education, but also serve children, their own children who've been displaced. Um, and because we have such a, a, a global reach as the Association Montessori International, this means that we could have some sort of system on a country-by-country -country basis, so that if you were to have something like a flood or a natural disaster or conflict-related displacement, um, people who may be able to volunteer their expertise um, could help us on all three of those fronts. So I believe that we're currently uh, working with one of the uh, technical working groups on the Alliance on this very topic at the moment. So I hope that gives you some sort of an answer, Lynn. Perfect. Thank you so much. That's that. That is that is lovely. And uh, uh, Takako, perhaps you could also um, just tell us a, a little bit about the um, way in which uh, the peace boat work um, has influenced all of your kind of 
connections in Japan? Do you has that created more connections for you beyond just the peace boat itself? Well, in a way, the staff working at peace boat come to Cafe Slow and come. Cafe Slow people go to Peace Boat. It's really a cross <laughs> section. And they some of them decided to live in the town where Cafe Slow is and vice versa. Because once you traveled around the world for three months, you don't want to work at nine to five regular work anymore. They try to find a work that's sustainable, more peace, peaceful. So they come to Cafe Slow for work. So it's really interesting exchange. That, 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 thank you so much. And uh, Takaka, could you possibly share the website where, where, which will connect us to the talk in uh, that, that's coming up in with Judy in in. Oh yes. Very okay. Near. Um, I think there is Setsuko Miura here. Yes. Setsuko San, can you put it up because? Um, or it can, yeah. It can, yeah. It, or you can go to the AMI website and look up the training center in in Tokyo, and it should yeah. also. It's you. organized by Alumni Association, so yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. We'll do that. And if not, we'll we'll send it round. Uh, okay. Thank you very much for that. Um, and uh, I would just say to you all that um, we are so grateful that you joined us today. Thank you, Setsuko. She's putting it into the chat there. I see. Thank you. Arigato. Thank you. And just to say to you all that um, whilst it is so inspiring to hear of these amazing contributions through our Montessori lens and our, our, our work that both um, Alain and Takako have done, we also know that all of you are making those kinds of contributions too in your various different ways. And so as we start 2024, I think it's terribly important for us all to know that each one of us can genuinely make a difference in this world. And although sometimes the news causes us to stop and to despair, we are actually doing something. We have actions. You are all taking them. You're all doing something. You're all connecting to adults and children, to elders and to others in our world that can make a difference. And so we're thankful, so thankful for all of you. Thank you very much indeed. Continue doing the work that you're doing. Do as much of it but know that you don't do it alone. You do it with all of us. So thank you very, very much to all of you. A happy new year to those that are celebrating, to those that are still to celebrate the new year. Uh, let's make 2024 one in which we can be connected. Thank you very much indeed.